I thank all the Sahajogis from Derbyshire and Birmingham for giving me this opportunity to talk to the seekers of this place. <coughs> we have seekers in the modern times. It's something very unique. We never had seekers before at least not so many. There used to be people who would seek money, as there are many who are seeking these days, who would seek countries after countries, the power. There were many who were seeking these few pearls, of bliss of God, very few. The reason was the awareness, the collective awareness of human beings <coughs> did not think themselves perhaps capable or perhaps needy, some seeking. But today it's such a beautiful combination that there are seekers of very high quality born on this earth, those who are seeking are in masses. They are not one or two here and there sitting on top of a mountain cave or something and trying to meditate, but there are so many who are seeking, who feel dissatisfied with themselves, with whatever they have, they think there must be something beyond. Those who feel that they have not yet found their meaning, those who feel they have to find the purpose of their life, those who feel that there has to be something higher than what they are into, all such people are seekers, not of today, but of thousands of years. At the time of Christ, there were none, I should say, because even the ones Christ took as his disciples, they were actually forced into it, and he had to go and seek them and find them out and tell them about it. So we have to say that these are very important times in the history of creation where there are so many seekers. But the problem with the seekers today is this, that they don't know what they are seeking. They have no idea as to what to seek, how to seek, what to expect. They, it's an unknown area they are entering into. It's very unknown to them. And this unknown area which they are seeking is now represented by so many people. Everyone says, I am the one who will deliver the goods. Another one says, I am the one who can do it. Naturally, confusion is created, as it is modern times are the times of confusion, great confusion. 
And when there's such a confusion comes in, then only we find out a great solution also, a permanent solution to solve the problem once for all. There has been no, never such confusion in the minds of human beings as it is today, as to the right or wrong. Never so much. Whatever was said, this was not good, they would do. Knowingly that they are doing wrong. If it, they were good people, they would say, all right, this is good, we'll do the good. But everybody knew that this was wrong or right. They may do it. But today, no one knows what is wrong and what is right. Apart from wrong and right, it's much beyond that. You have to know yourself. Because this awareness is within us that we do not know ourselves. We do not know the absolute. We live in a relative world. Of this, everybody seems to be conscious, maybe in the subconscious or maybe in the unconscious. But definitely there's a feeling in every one of us that we do not know. And it's a very honest feeling. It's a very sublime feeling that we have to know something more. Now when we say the word no, we think uh, as if I would say, I don't know about the Vishar, I have never been there. Now this means what? I don't know about the Vishar. I mean, what do, don't I know about the Vishar? I can read it in the books, I can find out. I can know all the history of the Vishar. I can find out who are the people who, will, who were making beautiful porcelain here. I can find out all about their history, everything I can read about it. Still, why should I say I don't know anything about Derbyshire? Because I have not been to Derbyshire before. I have not been to Derby. I have not been to this area. I have not seen this place. I have not visited it. I have had no experience of this place, so I don't know about it. This is exactly what is the situation. The situation is that we do not know about the Divine. We have read about it. We have heard about it. So many people have written about it. Once they know there's an inquiry about it, they come out with books. Books after books, thousands of books they have written. How many of them are true and how many of them are untrue? It is impossible to find out because we do not actually know. Supposing somebody says that Duke of Bedford was born in Derbyshire. All right, how will I know? I would not know till I meet somebody who is really belonging to that place, who knows about it. In the same way, the knowledge that we have also about divine is very confusing. But this is not knowledge. This is never the knowledge. The idea of knowledge comes to us as if it is a kind of a, an answer to our inquiries which is rational which we can understand intelligently through our intelligence. But now this area is beyond intelligence, beyond rationality. Beyond all that is limited is the unlimited area. All such unlimited areas can be only known by experience of your awareness. Now this one should understand is a very delicate thing, how to know something, an experience, of our awareness. Not an experience, you suddenly see a light, so it's an experience. I mean, you can always see a light. It's so great. The people feel about it that they have seen some light suddenly sparking before them. Nothing so great. There could be some areas from there a sparking can come and maybe uh, it is of no use to you, but just you might feel that you have experienced. So one must know that seeing is not experiencing. For example, a dog sees this instrument. But what does he know about it? He sees it. Awareness, the human awareness, has so many great things about itself compared to the animal awareness. For example, we can say the awareness of beauty, animals don't have, awareness of cleanliness, Animals don't have. Human beings have these built within themselves. They can feel it. They can feel it on their central nervous system. So whatever is your awareness is to be felt on your central nervous system. It's not just an imaginary thing 
or an intellectual discussion. Ah, yes, yes, I know, I know, not that. The knowledge should come to you through your feelings. Like, I can feel this is hot or cold, but a stone will not feel anything. In the same way, the feeling has to come through your central nervous system. That means your awareness itself is to be going, is, has to be charged. It has to get a new dimension. Your awareness itself has to get a new dimension. All other experiences has no meaning whatsoever in evolution, if you see. In evolutionary process, it is the awareness that improves, receives better and better dimensions. And these dimensions have reached its maximum at the time when you become a human being, where your awareness is just ready to receive the awareness of the universal being, of the collective being, so that you become the collective being. Now, I would like to tell you about this within ourselves, how we are placed. For every practical purposes, you should not take me for granted. But you should not also deny what I tell you. It's like entering into a new university. We listen to the professor and we try to follow him. Supposing he propounded, he propounds a hypothesis before you, then you just start judging it. Work it out. If it is true, then you call it a law. In the same way, we should enter into this new understanding by first seeing it, not denying it. Then if it is true, then we have to believe it. There should be no blind faith about Sahaja Yoga. Blind faith does not help at all. Neither there should be a denial. And with that cheerful attitude, if you just listen to me as a hypothesis, whatever I'm telling you, you need not accept it as to just now. But then the time has come for me to prove the truth to you, and the truth can be proved to you. Time has come to prove the existence of God, to prove, not prove that I give you a big lecture or take you to courts or some sort of a thing like that, but how am I going to prove it on your awareness? It is going to be absolute experience of your awareness that you are going to feel God Almighty. Time has come to prove the scriptures, all the scriptures. The time has come to prove your own connection with God, your own relationship with Him your own relationship with that primordial being, whether you call it God or anything, I, it makes no difference to God him, Himself. Whether you call Him by any name, there is God, and that God is not the way you conceive God, it's not the way you understand God or you know God, but is the God as He is. Unless and until you, yourself, feel Him, you are not going to believe in Him. Even if you believe under certain circumstances, it's a belief that is blind. It has no meaning for any intelligent person, and a day will come that such a person is going to denounce that kind of a blind faith. So now within ourselves, as I said, is a built-in system which has come to us through our ascent in our awareness at different stages, which is like a history written within ourselves, how we become human beings into different stages we were divided. First of all, the stage of the carbon, where we became alive, the dead became the life. That is placed at that point. It is below that great power within us, which lies in the triangular bone, which we call as Kundalini. This power is the power also described in the Bible, as the tree of life, I'll appear before you like tongues of flames. But Bible being a very microscopic thing, it cannot be explained, the symbolism of that. 
unless and until you get your new awareness or the vibratory awareness, it cannot be explained. Now this power is the power of desire, of the ultimate desire, the only desire, the real desire that we have within ourselves. All other desires become useless. See, in the affluent countries now, people have achieved affluence, they are rich, well-to-do, but they are not happy. People who are extremely affluent, like in Sweden and in Switzerland, they are competing among themselves. How many youths are going to commit suicide? Recently I learned that Swiss people are better off. Many more Swiss people are committing suicide than the people who were young people in Sweden. This is the state where we should realize that affluence, if it was our desire, is not the real desire. Because when we got the affluence, we should have been very happy and joyous people, but we are not. And the basics of economics is that Wants in particular may be satiable, but in general they are never satiable, means matter cannot satisfy your wants. So what is the want? What is the seeking one has is hidden in this power, and that is the seeking to become one with God, the yoga, the union with God, what we call the baptism. In the Quran is called as the peer. You have to become the peer, the twice born. It is described in various languages, but the same thing that they have described is the same in every scripture. If you try to follow what uh, it means, you'll be amazed that they all said the same things. Now somebody might say there might be some other methods, mother. It can be something else that can work it out. There's no other method, because this has been worked out for thousands and thousands of years within yourself since you became carbon, and is all arranged within you by nature. Like somebody can say that a seed has to sprout by some other method. There is no other met method for a seed. The seed has got a primule, and the primule has to be awakened. Is the only way it works out. In the same way, it is going to work out in all of you. This power is to be shaken within you. It is to be awakened within you. If it is awakened within you, it rises. But what is this power? This power is to become one with the Spirit. So this power knows that it has to become one with the Divine. Now, we have so many other desires, so we should say, how is it related to that? It's like this, that we have to say, come to the Bishar and meet you all people. Now we come all the way, we come up to Guildhall, come up here and don't meet you. Then all my coming, all my traveling is useless because I've not met you. It has no meaning whatsoever in the same way. All other desires are just to accomplish this desire, the ultimate desire, the desire to become one with the Divine. Lots of things can be said about Kundalini. I must have spoken hundreds of times about Kundalini. And to know more about it, you will have to get to Sahaja Yoga, I know more about it, but just now I have told you in brief what is this Kundalini and how it is placed there. Now the, above that is the second, actually the second one we treat as the third one it looks here, is the power of, uh, I was saying up here, this is the center of our seeking. This center is called as the Nabhi Chakra which gives us our seeking. When we are in the state of animal, then we seek food, 
through our stomach. And you'll be amazed then when we become human beings also, we seek our money through our stomach. We may get little diverted here and there, but ultimately we even seek our God through our stomach. Surrounding this stomach is the area where one has to cross. And this area is actually the area of the masters. All the primordial masters were born in this area, like Moses, Socrates. There are main basic ten primordial beings who came on this earth, who <coughs> came to give us an idea as to our seeking, what we have to do. Basically, they came here to teach us how to balance ourselves how to balance so we can ascend. Now all these great prophets or primordial beings, we should say they were the ones who were the masters, they came to inform us that if you cross too much onto the left side or too much on the right side, then you will be falling in your sustenance, in your quality as a human being. As a human being, you have to have a sustenance. And this is the center that gradually unfolds the sustenance from animal to higher animals and to human stage, where a person starts realizing that these sustenances exist within us. That's how all our laws have come. The Ten Commandments of the Bible are the ten sustenances that are within us. These are the ten gurus who came on this earth to save human beings from getting out of the middle path, going more to the left and more to the right. Now the left side, as you see here, is the side which is the emotional side within us, is also the power of desire is the emotional side which gives us our subconscious and beyond that is our collective subconscious. On the right hand side, we have another power of action that our desire we try to put in the action and this power of action gives us our future and sustains our physical and mental activities. As a result of that, we develop an institution in our head called ego. Everyone has it. There's nothing to be frightened of. When we do something, we feel we have done it. And that is a myth, but still, we carry on with the myth because we have not yet seen the reality. The another one is the left side power within us by which we receive the aggression of others, by which we have our past, gives us an institution as a byproduct of our activity, emotional activity, an institution like a balloon you will see there called as supari. These two things meet in the head just like this. As you grow and a calcification takes place on top of your head, near the fontanel bone area and this soft area which is pulsating in childhood becomes completely covered. <coughs> Thus you developed your eyes. you become Mr. X, Y, Z and all that. You develop your own freedom. This is the freedom that you have achieved to be Mr. X, Mr. Y, Mr. Z. After achieving this, you start using the second center, which is the center of your creativity, the center of your action. Animals do not have any ego. Of course, if they live with human beings, they may develop. But otherwise they have no ego at all. And <coughs> if you uh, do something wrong, you feel hurt, you feel guilty. Animals never feel guilty. 
because it is in their nature to kill another animal, it is in their nature to eat, so they never feel guilty. It's only human beings who say, oh, I should not have said this, I should have not done this. This is only human quality that we feel guilty. It is only human quality that we aggress others. <coughs> so the second center comes into play by which you think, and you think about the future, you plan. Your physical, I think it's too much now, can you stop it? Can't you stop it? Better stop the light, it's too much. I've been having this all through, it's too much. And you think, for that thinking you require energy, and this energy you get from the cells of fats that are in the stomach which are converted for the use of brain. And when this conversion takes place, this poor center has to work very hard. When you think this center goes into action, it has to work very, very hard for one work only, and that is to look after the supply of fat cells. There's too many lights there. Can you put off these lights? Just on. I mean, uh, Can you please put up the <laughs> strong overhead lights? No, 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 these three and four. These three <laughs> just here, just these three here. <laughs> or this, this series here. Thank you. Still these are very much. These three, if they can put up, will be better. No, no, these three. These three are too much. There's no need at all, there's three, what is that? I mean, I can see me otherwise. Can you not see me? <laughs> it's like, you feel like shooting. <laughs> ah. So this, this center, that is what we call the Swadhisthana center, is a center that gives you your future, energy, to think of your future, your planning, which gives you energy to bring forth the manifestation of the physical labor or physical exercise or physical work. This poor center has to work for one work, to convert the fat for the use of the brain. Now if one center which has to do many other things starts doing only one work, all other things are neglected. As a result of that, you develop problems because it has to cater to your liver, to your pancreas, to your kidneys, uh, to your spleen. And once it goes into action for one channelized work, it gets programmed for it. And then it cannot take care of these things. That's how you develop a bad liver. You develop a diabetes, kidney trouble, blood pressures. Also you develop a very serious disease called blood cancer. Now Sahaja Yoga can cure all these troubles. It's only physical, but it can cure even physical troubles because if this center is brought to its normal behavior, if it is made to behave in a very normal way, you can easily cure all such diseases which come out of your over-activity, over-thinking, over-imaginativeness. It's a very dangerous thing to always think about the future. For example, now we are here sitting down, we should be comfortably sitting down and talking to each other. Instead of that, now we are thinking, what am I going to go? do tomorrow or what am I going to do when I go home, how I am going to cook, what am I going to eat or how I am going to take my train. All these futuristic behaviors lead you to a very funny personality. You become so futuristic that you forget the past. I met a gentleman who did, forgot even his own name. He forgot the name of his father, he forgot the name of his mother, and also 
to the dismay of his wife, her name. And she started crying. She said, now what to do? He's forgotten everything. Now he is in a futuristic area. <laughs> he just knows the future. Then he was to be pushed back again into the center. Then gradually he started remembering. Then he told me that he's chairman of one of the councils of a big district place in India. And he said he was. He said, no, I am. I said, that's good. That's better. Now <laughs> you are in that state where you say, I am. So this is what happens. And this is what's going to happen to our societies here, which is very futuristic. So to cut it down, one can try anything. You may try anything, for example, you may show pictures of the past and things like that, but that is not going to bring back the horse. It's running very fast. The only thing that can work it out is the awakening of the Kundalini. When the Kundalini awakens itself, she makes the center enlightened and the center itself resumes its normal shape, its normal behavior and its normal condition. Apart from that, it has got a dynamic power or manifestation, that this one, this center which looks after our attention becomes enlightened and our attention becomes enlightened and the attention which is enlightened becomes dynamic. In the sense now, sitting down here, you can pay attention to anyone, just pay attention, you don't have to do anything. Just pay attention to that person and you can find out on your fingertips what's the matter with the person. Thousands of miles, he may be. When Nixon was having trouble, suddenly, I don't know, I said, find out about Nixon, how is he? And they said, ma, he's in a terrible mess. Christ has said, your hands will speak. That's the time has come. These hands, which, we, which look so simple, but they are so intricate and so intricately built that the nerve endings are so microscopic that we cannot understand how much they can tell us, how far they can go. When the awakening takes place, you start feeling the vibrations around you, the all-pervading power which you have never felt before. Through these fingertips, these fingertips which we neglect, we misuse them, we use them for wrong things, these fingertips themselves get enlightened and you start feeling them. That's what I said that you have to get your awareness which is enlightened. It's the awareness which has to manifest. And that's how you start feeling them on your fingers. It's wrong here, it's wrong there. You can see where is the problem. Now all these are related to your centers. These are five, six and seven. Seven on the left and seven on the right. So this is about your emotional side and this is about your right about your physical and your rational or you can say mental side. So you can make out a person how he is by just knowing whether you are getting heat from that person, whether you are getting burning from that person, whether they are getting numb, whether they are becoming, becoming heavy. And a report is established with the all-pervading power which informs you, get the messages. And the messages are so correct that even if you have ten children who are realized souls, there are many children these days are born as realized souls. We don't understand children these days, but these days they are great children and they are born today because the time has come. This is the time of judgment time. This is the time of resurrection. This is the time about which people have described in all the scriptures. So great people are taking birth. And these children, if you tie them up, and <coughs> their eyes and ask them, about a person who is sitting, facing them, what's the problem with this person? They will all raise the same finger. All of them will raise the same finger, even if their eyes are tied, even if their backs are towards the person, they can just push back their hands and say, they are so good, children are so good. You see, when they put their fingers in the mouth, we sometimes think, I don't know, Freud, who might call a very half-baked person, he didn't know much about 
God and life and nothing at all. He was very little bit he knew. He says that this has something to watch sex. He was nothing but a sex point and he wants everybody to be a sex point, not a human being. So this fellow, whatever he may say, but the truth is that it is nothing to do with sex. It is that they feel the heat on their fingers. They actually feel it. And that's how they put it in the mouth. The little, little children I've seen, we have one here who has come from England, uh, from London. There's another one who is from here somewhere. And she, all of these, if you ask them, they will immediately tell, where is the catch? Which chakra is catch? Now, children, you cannot be fooled. They all tell you the same thing, that this is what is happening. So your awareness is enlightened and your hands, which have got the sympathetic uh, endings here, tell you. We can say that now, in our central nervous system, we can feel about others and about ourselves. Now, supposing you are sitting here and I ask you, what's the problem with you? You would say, I don't know what's the problem with me. Yes, I don't know. But I may be able to tell you what's the problem. If you go and see the doctor, he'll say, yes, that's the problem. How do you know? You don't have to go to any examination for all pathological examination where all your teeth are taken out, eyes are taken out, and by the time you end up, they tell you, you are the healthiest man. <laughs> you don't have to go to all these horrible things. You don't have to waste any money and uh, try all these uh, frustrating things. Just putting your hands, you will know about yourself. And the people who are Sahaja Yogis will tell you that this is what is wrong with you and this is how you cure. Now the time has come. This is such a fantastic time. With Sahaja Yoga, we have cured so many for cancer patients, so many blood cancer patients. Recently a girl who is a Sahaja Yogini in uh, New York has cured a, can a blood cancer patient. This boy was about to die. They had declared that he's going to die. That's declaration they had given about uh, for about 15 days they said he may live and then he's going to die. I mean, that's the only thing they could do with all the things poor fellow had gone through. The boy had come from India, the, all the money was spent and this was the certificate he got that he's going to die within 15 days. Now, some of these people contacted me and I told them to contact a Sahaja Yogini in New York. And they told that such and such boy is there, his name is Rahul. He is hardly about 16 years of age. He had blood cancer. The boy not only got cured, he came down to London to see me and he's back in his home. It sounds very fantastic that how can a person who is not a doctor, who has nothing to do with medicine, can cure. Beyond all these medicines, beyond all these things, is the subtle power, the divine power from where everything has come. If you somehow or other become the owner of that or the person who knows how to handle it, you can cure anyone you want. It's not that I'm curing these days, my disciples are curing. I don't know how many people this Dr. Warren, who was a doctor, has cured through Sahaja Yoga, which is not a medical science. How many patients he himself has cured, he won't be able to count. So the whole system is going to change. Now you are going to become the master of yourself, of your powers, and all these powers are going to be released from. Now when we say that there were gurus who could cure, there were gurus who could stop uh, a growth of a horrible disease and things like that, we think it's not possible. We think it is an impossible thing. How can it be? How can we believe it? It's a cock and bull story. But you yourself, when you see manifesting it, you'll be amazed. Once I was tra traveling by a ship, and the captain of the ship, I gave him realization. And it so happened that one of the uh, ship's uh, staff got into the freezer, and uh, he got choked up and he got pneumonia. Of course, if it, I was in a position, I was traveling because uh, my husband was the chairman of that company. So he would not ask me to go down. He thought it was too much to ask me. I said, all right, if you don't allow me to go down, you better go down to the spot where he is. 
don't send any SOS to call a doctor or anything, you just go and put your hand on his chest for about five minutes. His pneumonia got cured completely. And this Captain Kuto could not believe it. He said, how could it be? I said, it is, that has happened to you. Now you have become that, accept it. You must assume that power what has been given to you, as in Sanskrit language we say, Viraj. <coughs> assume it. You see, even if you have given a throne, if you don't know how to assume the power of the throne, to believe into it, then like a beggar boy, if you put him on the throne, he still sees people coming down, he puts his hand before, give me five rupees, give me five rupees. Unless and until you assume these powers, you are still uncertain, but you have got them. And this is the point which is very difficult with the Western mind, especially because they cannot believe that they can have these powers. They just can't believe it. You tell them, but they said, how can that be? But it is so. Now, for example, this instrument, if you take it to a village and tell them that this will carry your voices around, or if you take, a, a, say, a television set and tell them that you can see all kinds of cinemas or we can say a drama and play or music out of this. He's not going to believe. He'll say, this box, this looks like an ordinary wooden box. But when you plug in, it shows its power. In the same way, what you look at human beings as something very, very uh, ordinary, mundane thing, for us, we take it for granted ourselves. We don't know how glorified we are, how great we are, how God has created us with such difficulty, with such care, with such love, for a very special purpose that He wants to bestow all His powers upon you. He wants you to enter into the kingdom of God and to enjoy His blessings, His love. It is something that we cannot believe, we are so frustrated, we are so disgusted with ourselves, with our societies, with everything. But it's not so. It's not so. It just has to happen. You are just to be plugged in to the mains and it works, and it works. It has worked. It has worked with thousands and it should work with you. But the absurd ideas people have, which is the conception they have, that you can pay for it. I mean, how can you pay for anything that is living? Have you ever paid anything for that is living? Like, have you paid anything for getting a fruit out of a flower? Can you pay to the flower, all right, I give you one pound, give me a fruit? Will it work out? It's that absurd that you cannot pay for the living God. You cannot pay for the living experience and you cannot pay for the evolutionary process. It is spontaneous, it is within ourselves, it works out. For we understand money so much that we can't understand that is free, though we have got so many things free. So many things we have got free, still we don't understand the importance of free things because we think whatever is free cannot be great. Actually, all great things have to be free, otherwise we won't exist. We won't live. If we didn't get air to breathe freely, we will not exist. If it happens sometimes in an aeroplane or someplace, you should see, then people realize the importance of those free things which we take it for granted. So, one has to understand the conception that we have about God, about achieving Him, about getting into ourselves, is also faulty. We think that supposing we stand on our heads, we'll get it. I mean, standing on our heads, if we can get God, then in all evolutionary process, they should have stood on their heads. Or we think that by running these races we'll get it, or by eating this kind of food or that kind of food, or by doing this or that, we'll get it, it's wrong. But then you may ask that why all these people in religion said that thou shalt not commit this, thou shalt not do that. They said it because these are the things which are required for our sustainers for our balancing as a human being. We lose our balance if we do not do these things. We have to have the balance, that's why it was said, don't do it. Human beings have a capacity to go to extremes. I mean, you tell them something. I've known people. You just tell them that to cure this particular center, 
you have to do this asana or you have to do this kind of a thing. They will do it hundred times, thousand times in one day. I mean, I never asked them, I said, just once in a while you do it or once a week. They'll do it hundred times. We go to extremes. And that's why to strike the balance, these people told us, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. But then in our ego we say, why not, what's wrong? All right, go ahead. When do you tell the children, don't smoke, why not? All my friends are smoking, I'll smoke. All right, go ahead. Smoke, get cancer, then you'll have a hole here, breathe through that. After some time this will go away, the nose will go away and you'll be moving like a machine looking at everyone. You can't talk, you cannot live like a normal person. Then you one realizes that, oh God, I wish I had not smoked. But in Sahaja Yoga we don't say, don't smoke, because half of the people will buck off. We never say, don't drink, never say anything, don't. We say, all right, you are doing it, it's all right. Let this happen. As soon as this happens, you just give up yourself. Because when you have found the highest, then you don't care for all these small things. All your habits drop out. Automatically, I don't have to force you for that. You have everything within you, that power, like you get lifted up. Like a lotus that rises out of the mire, by its own force you come up and your fragrance fills that mire. And you are amazed at it yourself. First you are identified with that mire and you think that this is what it is. It is not so. When it comes up that lotus, it spreads. It's beautiful petals and the fragrance gives us that personality. It spreads all over and that's what is going to happen to you. All of you are going to be that lotus which looks hidden, which is absolutely invisible, invisible within you, which is going to open out and the fragrance of your divinity is going to spread. Now, today I cannot cover all the centers because if I start covering all the centers, it will be a very lengthy thing. I've covered three centers, as you have seen, the Muladhara Chakra, the Swadhisthana and the Nabhi Chakra and others I'll cover later on tomorrow, but I must talk about the spirit about which we are talking uh, for ages now, that we have to become the spirit. Now, English language, as you know, spirit can be anything. It's a very ambiguous word. We even to alcohols, we call it spirits, even to the dead souls, we call them spirits, and even to the spirit, that is, we are the pure being, which is called as Atma in Sanskrit language, we call the word spirit. Here I am saying, talking about that spirit, which is the pure being within you, which is a detached being within you, which is the witness within you, which sees you all the time, which watches you which resides within you as joy and happiness in the heart. It resides in the heart. This spirit is not in our conscious mind, is not in our central nervous system, is not under our control. To give it an analogy, I say that the left side within us is like the brake and the right side is like an accelerator in a car. Now, in the car, we are learning driving, sitting in the front seat. And there is the master watching at the back and seeing the whole play. Now what you do is to go to the left, means sometimes you put the brake, sometimes you put the accelerator, make mistakes and then you learn how to drive. That learning how to drive is the wisdom part of it which comes to us through balancing our lives. Balance is the most important thing to begin with. But even if you have, don't have balance, I have seen in Sahaja Yoga very imbalanced people get into the balance. Now this balancing, left and right, or say of the brake and the accelerator, gives you a position where you can say, now you have mastered the driving. But still there is the master sitting at the back then you become the master. The master is the spirit within you. 
you become the spirit and you start watch, watching yourself as a driver. The whole thing becomes like a play, like a drama. That you separate yourself and start seeing <coughs> everything happening before your eyes. Everything happening just like a drama outside you and you are not the part and parcel of it. So you enter into the area of your axis and the periphery loses its impact on you. <coughs> you become a person who is silent, blissful, quiet and sees the periphery, the movement of the periphery, but you are not in it. That's how you become the master. That's how you become the prophet. But Sahaja Yoga today has a power to make the prophets out of the men of God and these prophets will have power to make others prophet. So says William Blake, the great poet of this country. And that's what exactly what Sahaja Yoga is. He predicted it hundred years back and today if you come to Sahaja Yoga, you'll be amazed what you are. Whatever he has produced, predicted about England, being the Jerusalem of tomorrow, that tomorrow is today. This country of yours, England, which is so far, I don't know if people understand or aware of what this country is, which is the heart of the universe, which is the most important part of the universe, has to become the Jerusalem. For that the Englishmen have to come out of their inertia to see what are their potentials, to rise up to that point and that's going to work out. It's already is working very well in London. Of course, we can't have too many people because plastics can be produced in the machines in thousands. But if you have to have something living, it takes time. But once it takes time, when it come, once it comes to its maturity, I'm sure this great country is going to assume that status of becoming Jerusalem, the place of worship, where people have to come to worship. It's very surprising, things are happening with Sahaja Yoga. The flower daisy, which never had any fragrance, if you go and see now, is having fragrance. Most of the English flowers had no fragrance. They were known by that. Most of the flowers are now having tremendous fragrance. You can see for yourself. All these things are working by nature, are worked out, they are coming. What about human beings? Where are they? What are they doing? Where are they lost? This is a very sad thing. I came to London, just by chance I should say, or maybe that is prearranged. My husband got elected to this job and he had to come. And this agency of the UN is only placed here. It's in England. It's nowhere else. You have only one agency of the UN. That is in England, for which my, got, my husband got elected, and so I'm here. Otherwise, I don't think I could have come here like a guru, because I don't have uh, any other interest but this. And I could not have come here otherwise, because uninvited I would not come to a country. But I came here as an invited person. It's all working out. Only you people have to work it out yourself and understand not only the dynamism, the vitality, but the greatest importance is that at this point you are standing on the verge of destruction or construction. And the English people have a special place. They have to rise up to it because they are the cells of the heart. I'll have this lecture tomorrow again. I will hope you'll come and make it comfortable. Sorry for my throat, I've been speaking day in and day out every day. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I would like to answer them. <coughs> What am I using? <coughs> is it not? This is not, is it not? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. But this is additional, is it? <laughs> Thank you. Just 
use the roving mic if you want. It's all right. It's too much to be. Too much to Can I have answers, uh, questions from you, and then I'll answer. You said you could cure with after self-realization. His problem is that somebody has died. Dead. His mother is dead. He dead. wants to know if you can. Why? Oh, deaf. I beg your pardon. Deaf. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> can you fix that hearing problem? You see, this question is such that it makes you feel that I am a person here to cure everyone. We are satellites today. It's a byproduct of awakening of the Kundalini, you get cured. I am sorry for that, that you have misunderstanding that I am here to cure all the people. I should settle down in a hospital. The main thing is, Kundalini has to be awakened to get you cured. Alright? If your mother was here, we could work it out. But the main thing you must understand that God has lot of common sense as we have. And He is only interested in such lives as we are, which will work out His work. Those who are, say, very sick people, extremely sick, can get cured in a second. You will be amazed, I tell you. Our president of India, he went to America for his treatment when they quit. And he was going back to India. And I went to see him as Mrs. So and so. But the High Commissioner told him that I'm so and so, and he had heard my name in India. His wife said, Why don't you cure my husband? And he was just on his last that prepared everything for his last rites in India. I just put my hand on his back for 10 minutes. He won't be here. He had not slept for days together to pray. He said, my pain is to leave, go to sleep. When he got up, he was perfectly honest. He walked down, people had brought <coughs> churches and things. He just walked down, they couldn't believe that. But this has happened because he is going to be used. for the work of God. In our house, if you have lights, which are never going to give light, we don't bother about them. We sell them in the job. In the same way, the divine doesn't cure people. All of them. It does. Many. Thousands. But some of the people who are very sick, it says, all right, you go through the second cycle, all right, come back purified, rested, and then it works out. So not necessarily that everybody will be cured, not necessary. But so many have got cured. I test them. But that's not our main job is to give cures to people. No, it is to give realization to people. And as a byproduct, as you said, of course, if she gets realization, I will bless you. Many people have cured their deafness. Not only deafness, but even bald-headed people have got hair. He had no hair on his head when he came to me. <laughs> but I would say that after realization and before realization, so tremendous <laughs> that it's better to take photographs before realization. And see yourself come sometimes after realization. People see they have got their photographs before realization and throw them away. It is different. But the main thing is not curing, it's the self realization. That's the thing. And age has no problem. Yesterday, I think in Bermuda, we gave realization to somebody who was a very, very, very old man. So age has no consideration, 
health has no consideration, nothing of the kind. Everyone can get and should try to get it. All right? So if you can get her, you'll work it out. But I don't promise it. All right? May God bless you. Of course, self-realization I promise. That I promise. If you have patience with yourself as I have with you, you have to have patience. Any other question, please? Yes. <clears throat> What is the problem? I've been having chest problems for the last four or five years. He's had chest problems for the last four or five years. Is there any way in which you can help him? Of course, that can be helped. Chest problem like breathing trouble or what? Yes. Breathing trouble? Asthma. Is he an Indian? Asthma. Asthma. Are you an Indian? Yes. Ah, Indians, you know, they take so much bath. They still think they are in India. Every day take bath in the morning and then go out, isn't it? That should not be done. This is England. We should take bath in the night. We should live like English people. Get great bathers. Indians are great bathers. You see, they must have a bath every day. Whether it is zero degrees or minus 12 degrees, they must have bath. You see, it's, it's a habit formation they have got. They don't feel all right without a bath. And that's how they develop. But in any case, we'll cure you and ask them, all right? It's not so difficult. But one should not take too much bath in England. I would suggest that if you, want, if you want to take bath, take it in the night, as the English people do. This is a very treacherous climate. And if you take your bath and get out of your bath, you are definite to catch these troubles in the chest. Not only that, but arthritis and all these things come out of this. This is very indiscriminate in this country. Mm. The climate is such, you have to be careful. Mm. I mean, one should not postpone bath, you know, bathing forever. <laughs> because you see, when I say something, I must give the other extreme also. <laughs> but we are great bathers, no doubt. You see, personal cleanliness is too much with Indians, too much. But uh, uh, general cleanliness, or you can say the collective cleanliness, is more here, you see. Uh, like mowing the lawn and looking after the cleanliness of the roofs and all, much better. I mean, we have to combine these things is important. That can work out, all right? Asthma is not such a problem. What else? In what way does it work out? We have a center within us, which is the center of Sri Rama. On the right hand side, we call it the right heart. And if we can cure that center of yours, we'll be all right. All right? Yes. We'll work it out. We'll tell you how to do it. How many thousands of years does the yoga date back from, she said? Which yoga you mean? Yoga has been there, the spontaneous yoga has been there throughout. You see, what is spontaneous is living. And the living process has been there throughout. So, we cannot say when it started. We can say when it got separated. When God and His power separated and God started watching the whole thing as a witness, the God Almighty, and His power started working it out, it created all the universes. It created our universe, out of which it created now human beings. And now it has to become one. Again, that creation has to know its creator. One, two, three, four, there have been always few people getting this connection. But today is the time for a mass evolution. So for a growth of life, you cannot give any time. You can't say when it started, how many years back. It has been on. But today is the blossom time when many have to get the blessings of yoga. All right? What is it? 
you spoke about Kundalini. For the ordinary person, it's very difficult to awaken. Yeah, who's told you that? It's not so. <coughs> you see, it is these abnormal people when they talk about Kundalini, they call it abnormal because they don't know how to do it. It's the easiest thing to do. It's the easiest thing to do if you are an awakened person. Even a child can do it. It's those people who say that Kundalini is very difficult are the people who have no idea of Kundalini at all. They are not masters. For a master, what is difficult? And even an ordinary can become a master, then what is difficult? These are not masters. These are people absolutely naive, money makers, useless people. They write books without knowing anything about Kundalini. They are the misguided people. It's the easiest thing to do. Just under your hand it will move, you will see it moving up, and you will see it pulsating on the head. It's not at all difficult. I told you it's the most vital thing that has to happen, and all that is vital has to be free and easy, Sahaja. Why? In India we have Nanaka who said, Sahaja Samadhi Lama. Sahaja Samadhi Lama. Nobody said it is difficult. Kabira never said it. He said, Pacho, Pachiso, Pakada, Bulau, Ekahi, Dora, Bandau. I'll get 25 people together and put them onto one thread. Those who had the authority always talk like that. Nobody said it is difficult. It's only these people who do not know the job, who have no authority, talk like that. Don't believe that. It's the easiest thing to do. You will see yourself. But supposing it is easiest, then why should we deny? Supposing I have got the diamond for free, won't you see it? Won't you have it? Or are we going to feel, oh, it's very difficult, how can I do When I'm saying it is easy, you don't have to pay for it. All right? But how do you think that? What's it? Without the purification of the body and without the purification of the mind, it can work, you know. No, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, see, that's correct. Sit down. Sit down. All right, all right. Please sit down. I'll tell you. That's the method people try. It doesn't work out that way. Say your car is something wrong with your car, all right? Now, can you clean it from out sitting inside? Can you put it You have to get out of it. So the first the Kundalini rising has to be done. You see, people have confused it. Even in Hatha Yoga, where there are Ashtangas. First thing is Ishwara Pranidhana, first establishment of God. First you are to be connected with God. Even in Christianity you are to be baptized first. Of course it's an artificial one, forget it, but you are to be baptized. Even as a Hindu you are to be Christian in a way what you call a Yagyopavita is done at the age of eight years. That's what realization is. or Mama uh, Saab and all these people use Sunta, that's the same thing. So the first thing is to get your realization, in, it doesn't mean that you become a master. But awakening of the Kundalini and then with the growth of the Kundalini you become a master. This was the real process but they have put it upside down. How can you cleanse yourself? Unless and until you get out of it. Supposing uh, my sari is spoiled, I have to take out my sari and clean it, isn't it? And that's why it is difficult. That is it. It's a confusion they have created. And don't believe in all these stories. If you try to suppress your ego, it will sit on your head. Never it will run out. If you try to suppress your super ego, it will never help. But here automatically it happens and how it happens I'll tell you tomorrow. By awakening these deities within yourself, these things are sucked in. Kundalini awakens and that's Last of all, if you want me to confess, there's something special about me that I can do it. Must be something. If you don't crucify me, I'll say that much, not more. You better find out.
Otherwise, first thing you need to is to crucify me. I don't want it anymore. All right? Thank you. May God bless you. Yes, my child. Mother, how can we help ourselves and help each other to open out our hearts and become more connected? It's not any surgery needed for that. In Sahaja Yoga we have techniques, divine techniques by the open our heart. The confusion is on another line also and this confusion has led us into problem. You see the confusion is about how our relationships should be to ourselves, to others and to the society. There is a big confusion that started long time back. When the smoothies were written, or we can say when the religion was practiced, it was just the other way around, we started doing everything. And that's how we have lost that capacity. The attitude towards ourselves should be that we should try to perfect ourselves. It's absolutely tyrannical attitude. I mean, when I try to perfect Sahaja Yoga, I'm tyrannical towards myself. The amount of work I take out of this body, the amount of exertions I can put in out of this body, the stretching of my complete patience to a great extent, I work it out. I mean, normally, you know, people get just clenched up, oh, mother, this is too much, we can't bear. You have seen it yourself. But you have to be really tyrannical to perfect yourself. That should be the way you should work it out towards ourselves and towards others. It should be an ideal relationship. Like, now you have a brother, he's your brother. It should be ideal. If he's your father, he should be an ideal. But such a confusion, the more enlightened so-called you become, the more elevated you become, the confusion is, who is your sister? Who is your mother? Who is your father? Then the relationship between the Sahaja also becomes confused. Your Sahaja is your own prophets. You must respect it. You are all prophets. You speak the same language. You have to love each other. It's not rational, it has to happen to you because the relationship has to be established. That relationship, that ideal relationship. So many people now, you have known that, get angry with me, mother, you are too patient with the surgeries. But they are my children. I have to perfect myself and my relationship with them should be ideal. I have to go to a great extent for cleaning them so that they come. So relationship with others should be ideal. Are you an ideal father? Are you an ideal mother? Are you an ideal sister and a brother? Are you an ideal citizen towards others? But the society has to be pragmatic. The society has to work it out pragmatically. And the pragmatic working out comes by changing. Supposing today, for I would say that for India we don't need vegetarianism. For England we need vegetarianism. It's all pragmatic. The society has to be pragmatic. Here we are pragmatic about ourselves. Not about the society. We are pragmatic about ourselves. Everything works out. What's wrong? A woman who has children will run away with another man. What's wrong? Or a woman who has children can sell the country for the sake of her children. What's wrong? So this confusion within us creates this problem and that's how we do not know how to open out ourselves. If you get, could get rid of our confusions, it could be all right. It can be done through surgery. All these confusions have been created by half-baked people, I would say. I, you, there's nothing wrong with the incarnations, with the prophets, nothing wrong with the perfect people. What is wrong with us, our attitude? And if we can discriminately use our attitude towards ourselves, towards others, and towards the society, everything wrong is going to be good. Because of this confusion, our heart is closed. We are frightened of others. What is there to be frightened? Relationship is ideal. What can they do? 
your relations, as far as they are concerned, your relations, so pure heart is ideal. Whatever they do is not the point. Whatever I do for them has to be ideal. I have to go on loving them. I have to go on admiring them, encouraging them, sustaining them, and giving them what I have to do as my relationship has to be. Say, for example, a source of water that is under the mother earth. Does it think what kind of a tree it is, what sort of things it is doing? It just gives its source, its water, in the same way. Because you are the source. So the relationship has to be cut. <coughs> these confusions have worked out and rationally we have accepted all these confusions. And this has led us into this kind of a trap that our hearts are closed. Alright?